All companies seek to reduce costs and maximize profits. That's why they always pay their employees as little as possible and exploit them as much as they can. I'm sure this is something you've heard so many times or even something that you think of yourselves. But what if I told you that it is false? Or at least false in the sense that companies do not always seek to pay their employees as little as possible and they do not seek to do so because no, it is not true that offering low salaries to workers necessarily leads to higher profits. In this video, we're going to tell you the case of a company that revolutionized the way we understand the labor market. We're talking about a company that from one year to the next, all of a sudden doubled the salaries of its workers. And that, contrary to what everybody expected, not only did not reduce its profits, but increased them. We will also explain the reasons that led to this result and above all, why, despite this, there are still companies that pay low wages. Nearly 120 years ago, in the Detroit of 1903, a group of 11 businessmen realized that something was changing in the world of technology. For some time, a German named Karl Benz had been marketing and developing a kind of carriage that needed no horses to move. A carriage that ran on a gasoline engine, which apparently was proving quite successful in Germany. That carriage, of course, was the first automobile in history. So without wasting any time, our group of entrepreneurs decided to imitate Benz's success and raise $28,000 to set up their own car factory. Of course, to set up a whole factory, it's not enough just to have money. They needed someone who knew what they were talking about, someone who could manage the project and who also had experience as an entrepreneur. Luckily, in that group of 11 people, there was already someone with that profile. In fact, he was the leader and main investor, a person who had already founded two other companies to develop cars. But who, because he was more focused on design than on sales, had not gone ahead with them. However, this time he already had the perfect car and was ready to launch it on the market. Well, visual economic viewers, we are talking about none other than Henry Ford and the automobile company that bears his name, the Ford Motor Company. And yes, I know if Henry Ford is studied in the history books, it is mainly for his role in the development of the assembly line production process. But let me tell you that this was not always the case in his great factory. Until 1908, Ford could be considered a center of independent craftsmen rather than an integrated factory as we might imagine it today. To give you an idea, in its early days, the company had just 450 employees, two thirds of whom were highly qualified masters, working according to their own standards and working methods. A bit chaotic, don't you think? Well, actually, this system of work made some sense since contrary to what it might seem, Ford was not exactly in the business of building cars from scratch, but rather assembling them. Every day, different parts arrived at the factory from different producers that the craftsmen had to mold, work on, and then join together to build each car. A type of car which, by the way, was not necessarily the same as the rest. And right here is the key that changed everything. Although the factory worked relatively well and made a profit, Henry Ford's philosophy was opposed to this way of producing, among other reasons because he considered it to be inefficient. So he decided to change it completely. So what was his philosophy then, you may ask? Well, listen for yourselves. The way to make cars is to make one car like another, to make them all identical. Just as coming out of the pen factory, one pin is like another pin, and coming out of the match factory, one match is like another match. Henry Ford, adapted quotation. As a result of this way of understanding the industry, between 1908 and 1914, a radical restructuring process took place in the Ford factory, a process that would conclude with the production of a single car model, the iconic Ford Model T. The great advantage of this change is that Ford could now order parts over and over and over again from its suppliers. That would always be the same for each and every vehicle. The parts would be the same size, the same shape, the same materials, and so on and so forth. In other words, from that point on, Ford no longer needed skilled craftsmen to mold the parts one by one. What it needed were workers to simply put them together. Something that was not only much faster, but also something that could be done by just about anyone. The effect of this restructuring was so extreme that the Ford factory went from having 450 employees in 1908 to 13,623 in 1913. And pay attention, because here comes the most important part. Of these 13,623 employees, 75% were foreigners with no education or qualifications. Ford was no longer a center of independent craftsmen, but an entire factory of operators who worked like clockwork, following very simple and specialized steps, which were also done one after the other in a work line. And just like that, Henry Ford's famous assembly line was born. 
As many of you already know, the results of this assembly line were impressive. The factory went from producing one car every 12 hours to producing one every 93 minutes. Annual profit rates exceeded 130% of the value of the assets, and 96 out of every 100 cars sold in the market were Ford Model Ts. Which, by the way, was not surprising if we take into account that while the Ford T cost $490 in 1915, the Cadillac Type 51, one of its competitors, cost four times as much, $1,975. In any case, Ford's Great Revolution still had one final step left, a step that would end up boosting his productivity and that would change economic theory forever. A step which we have already hinted about in this video. Money for all. In late 1913, when Ford's moving assembly line was up and running at full speed, great news reached the factory workers. As of the 1st of January 1914, workers were eligible for a wage increase. But take note, because it was not a small improvement. Not at all. It was a raise that boosted their pay from $2.34 to $5 per day of work. Yes, that's right. Henry Ford more than doubled the salary of his workers almost overnight. And yes, I'm sure many of you are thinking, come on, you're kidding, doubling a salary from two to five dollars? Well wait, calm down. To put it in perspective, updating the figures to today's value, it is as if a worker went from earning $1,800 to almost $3,890. Can you imagine if that happened in a company today? The curious thing is that this measure alone cost the company $10 million, which represented approximately 50% of the profits forecast for that year. And of course, the question is, how is it possible that Ford's shareholders were willing to lose half of their profits to implement such a steep wage hike? Did they become altruistic and stop pursuing their own interests? Well, the short answer is no, or at least that's not what the data indicates. Not only did the wage hike not lose Ford shareholders a single dollar, it made them even more money. Specifically, Ford managed to increase its car production by two thousand units increased its profits by 15% and the workforce increased its productivity by up to 70%. All this in a context where the price of its cars were constantly decreasing. Nevertheless, take a look. Surprised? I'm sure you are. But now, how is it possible that by increasing wages in such an exaggerated way, a company can recover the assumed cost and on top of that make even more money? What need did Ford have to do that? Could this be applied to all companies in the market and to any situation? Well, let's take a look. An efficiency wage. A first reason why we might think that Ford raised wages is because it did not have enough workers. Therefore, if it did not offer high wages, it could not produce as many cars as it would like to produce. However, nothing could be further from the truth. In 1914, a great crisis hit Detroit. Unemployment benefits doubled, and frankly, practically any unemployed person would have accepted a job in the Ford factory at a wage of $2 a day. So you can see that, no, the lack of workers had nothing to do with it. But take a look at this fact. In the year 1913 alone, 50,000 448 workers left their jobs at the Ford factory. Something that, if you have been paying attention, you will realize doesn't add up at all. How is it possible that more than 50,000 people resigned or were fired if I have just told you that for that year, there were only about 13,000 workers in the factory? 13,000. Well, it's entirely possible and it's called job rotation. Turns out that the work at the Ford factory was so hard and demanding that most of the workers decided to quit after three months. For the same job, there could be four different people occupying it throughout the year, and as you can imagine, this caused a lot of problems. These, for example, were the four main ones. One, every time a new worker arrived, he had to learn his job from scratch, which obviously slowed down the production process. Two, before resigning, many employees stopped coming to work and did not notify the factory in time for the factory to find a replacement. As a result, several days of work were lost every time someone resigned. Three, because foremen didn't know exactly how many or which workers they had at their disposal, in some cases they were poorly organized employees who performed unnecessary tasks. And four, since most workers left their jobs unsatisfied, many of them before leaving were sabotaging the factory or working at half throttle. In short, this was a very, very serious problem for Ford. Do you think it was a problem that the wage increase managed to solve? Well indeed, and it did so with flying colors. The 
the turnover rate dropped drastically from 370% in 1913 to only 16% in 1915. However, this was not the only problem that this abrupt salary increase managed to solve. As Henry Ford himself said, if the sweeper's heart is in his work, he can save us $5 a day by picking up small tools instead of sweeping them up. Motivation, effort, and commitment to the company played a fundamental role in this story. After the implementation of the new wages, absenteeism rates went from 10 to 2.5%. Sick leave was reduced by 90%, and albeit anecdotally, several stories from the factory support the thesis that employee motivation skyrocketed. Be that as it may, in this video, we still need to answer one question. Why don't all companies do what Henry Ford did and pay their employees more to improve productivity? Well, listen up. Evil of many, remedy of a few. The first reason why not all companies apply Henry Ford's high wage model is because not all of them have the same problems that the Ford Motor Company had. That is, even if a company pays relatively low wages, it does not necessarily suffer from high levels of labor turnover. And even if it does, this may not affect it as much as it did Ford on its assembly line. Second reason is that companies need to have certain control mechanisms over their employees. When Ford raised wages, the cost of an underworked employee rose. If I pay you more and you work less, I will be losing money. Money. So between 1913 and 1915, the number of supervisors in the factory went from one for every 25 workers to one for every 15. This is something very easy to do on an assembly line. However, the matter of evaluating staff gets a little tricky in less mechanical and more complicated jobs. So instead, many companies prefer to avoid the risk of paying more and then not having the results pay off. Another reason, and perhaps the most important of all, is that not everyone could afford to pay high salaries. And no, we do not mean paying a lot. We mean paying above average, which in economics is known as efficiency wages. You see, if Ford's measure was successful, it was because no one else but Ford paid $5 a day. If it lowered labor turnover and increased the effort of its workers, it was precisely because they knew that they would not find a better wage than the one Ford offered them. Not because it was a high wage, but because it was a unique wage that no one else was paying. Paying. Therefore, if all companies were to offer huge wage increases, then the job retention effects, which ultimately reduced turnover and improved performance, would just disappear. This could lead to a situation where companies compete to see which one offers the highest salaries, and only the most competitive will be able to replicate Ford's model. What's more, in Ford's case, it was in a rapidly expanding industry. In other words, its major problems were not related to costs or productivity, but to increasing its production as much as possible in the shortest amount of time while maintaining efficiency. In fact, it is common for many fast-growing industries to tend to pay higher wages. In any case, visual economic community, now I want to ask you the questions. If you owned a company, would you apply Ford's model? Or would you pay your employees more or less than what every other company in the industry pays? What other reasons can you think of for offering efficiency wages that we haven't explained? Did you know, by the way, that Henry Ford was not actually the inventor of the assembly line? I encourage you to research which other car company did it first, and then tell us about it in the comments. And as always, don't forget that here on Visual Economic, we release new videos every week, so subscribe to the channel, hit the little bell so you don't miss any of our updates. If you like the video, go ahead, give it a like, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care, see you soon.